Today, I'm delighted to welcome Eve Van Derm, Global Human Capital and Organization Transformation Leader at Deloitte to the Digital HR Leaders Podcast. Eve, welcome to the show. Uh, before we get started, could you please share with listeners a little bit about yourself and your role at Deloitte? So what's interesting to know about me is I used to be high performance sports coach. So was my first involvement with data performance in a different context. Joined the firm, as we call it, uh, about 14 years ago. Um, the role you describe is my, my current role. So in that sense, it's very uh, spot on. What's also linked to sort of the topic is I used to be leading human capital in our Belgium practice. And at that moment, we started looking at how do we make progress in what was that thing then called HR analytics? And we got into conversation with a sort of boutique uh, called Inostics. Um, and they joined us a couple of years ago, which accelerated sort of how we looked at it from a less generic sort of BI, how things were called at the time, to focusing more on people analytics. And I've been uh, had the pleasure to sort of see how that grew in our sort of larger organization uh, so I think that's also one of the elements which I think is very relevant to org transformation change, which is my responsibility, but the use of insights and data has been fueling that more in my experience, more in the context of transforming organizations, not always the HR function itself. Yeah, really interesting, certainly about the sports. I'm going to ask you a question about that in a minute as a follow-up, but um, many of those listening will recognize the name Inostics. Uh, Luke Smeyers, I think, was uh, was was part of we, when he was brought in yeah. working with you at Deloitte for a while, wasn't he? And uh, Luke, um, definitely one of the pioneers of of people analytics in Europe. Um, so, just want to give him a shout out. Hopefully, he'll he'll be listening. Um, so, Eve, that that link with high performance sports is really interesting, actually, because you know if we look at the, there's a lot that we can learn as organisations from from how sport look at performance and and how they use data to do that. I'm a big fan of Liverpool Football Club, who are probably one of the leading uh, Premier League teams when it comes to using in data in sport. I'd, I'd love to you know, share some insights and maybe what, what you learned from high-performance sport that, that's helping you in your current role. So I, I was in high-performance uh, sport coaching over 24 years ago now. So that's very old in terms of technology terms. So it was not always very advanced technology-wise. I was active in, in squash, which is not is very individual so has sort of a type of sport at the same time these sort of the, the 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 context in which the game is played is fairly constrained in terms of uh, literally the room is constrained and we used to do very simple things at the time which was literally you take so a piece of paper you take two colors uh, pens and you're just jotting where the ball is sort of bouncing and you have sort of a heat mapping of where the ball is moving to look at patterns which are involving the tactics which you could use to sort of influence game playing and sort of how you you adapt your tactics that's the sort of things which sort of real-time feedback that you could use to sort of improve feedback between games between sets which i think is a very sort of interesting perspective which i then sort of struggle to see back to sort of how do you help leaders managers to get better in the decisions they take which i sort of certainly 24 years ago felt like where is the data to take decisions especially when it comes to people and people performance i think we've come a long way since but if you compare it indeed to sports and if you do sort of advanced capabilities like and the ones you mentioned Liverpool we're certainly not there I think we see nice examples of audio analysis in terms of patterns in team behavior and even a shift work is happy to unpack that a bit more where you also sort of see equivalence of that but I would sort of suspect that we are not in most organizations we're not treating teams as high performing teams we talk about it but we don't use the same sort of depth and breadth of analytics to to gain one more inch, one more centimeter, one more second, one more, which I think is the sort of sports environment. How can you win these small things? I think in businesses and other organizations, we could absolutely learn more from that. But as I said, we've come a long way, so it's nice to see the progress as well. Yeah, and we've certainly seen progress, and you know, and, and obviously we'll be talking about that over the next sort of 45 minutes or so. Um, but what we already want to start with today is a topic that I know that that you're, um, you'll be quickly becoming an expert on, probably we're talking to your clients. Um, and you recently spoke on a on a Vizier webinar about the the new EU corporate sustainability reporting directive, which we will now recall call CSRD uh, for the rest of the, the rest of the conversation. And the, these new regulations, which I'm sure some of our listeners will know, have been signed into EU law, and they require companies who meet the specified criteria. And we can maybe probably cover what those criteria are in a minute to report on the impacts that they have on the environment their workforce and wider society and my understanding is that these companies have been given a deadline for submission in 2025 and that will cover both 2023 so i.e the year we're currently in 
uh, and 2024 data. Um, Eve, I'd love you to share, maybe share a little bit more about the, the CSRD regulation, certainly the companies that are in scope of that, because it's going to be most companies from from what I understand, and, and what this means for HR, given that, you know, maybe for the first time, this is placing the same importance on people data um, as there is on financial data. So, so it, it's a different speed. So for some organizations, and sorry to use some more jargon, but they used to be the non-financial regulatory directives, which reporting directives, sorry, which was already sort of applicable for some large quoted organizations. They are due to actually report 24 already, so which is tomorrow, basically. Um, the one that you mentioned for CSRD is as of 25. And of course, you have to be able to compare with sort of at least uh, one, preferably two years um, to be able to compare and see evolutions and actually make progress. The scope of organizations is actually massive because if you you need to meet sort of two out of three criteria, one of them is 250 uh, people contributing to your organizations. It's interesting sort of how the employee sort of definition has been evolving. It's a turnover of 40 million uh, euros or assets value above 20 million. As soon as you meet two out of the three, you are subject to uh, the directive and the reporting guidelines. And the reporting guidelines are a very extensive document. And that's only stage one where you talk about one workforce, which is about uh, just shy of 100 data points that you need to be able to report on and also describe in terms of actions, how you progress on a mixture of, of, of different sort of people related topics, which makes it very interesting. And I think it's also sort of the actions related to that that also make it a shift from it's not only compliance, which of course is important. Every law you need to comply with law, fine. But at the same time, sort of reporting on actions for improvement suggests that you need to go beyond sort of just complying. Well, here is my data. There's an action expected on things like gender pay gap, diversity, um, work-life balance. So quite a mixture of different topics, which I think it make it very interesting in terms of impact it can have on organizations and their performance on the people side as well. And it's, um, I mean, this is part of a trend because obviously we've seen in the US the Security and Exchange Commission's, you know, mandating disclosure of certain, certain human capital data. I think it was back in 2019, 2020, might get the, might get the year wrong there. Um, but this is... This is far, as you said, this isn't just about compliance. This is about action as well, which is which is, you know, perhaps taking it to the next level. And but I think it's part of a trend that that will continue. So this might be a leading question. If I apologize for that. But do do you think <laughs> do you think HR functions are, are currently at the data maturity level to be ready to report on CSRD? It's probably a sort of very broad type of um, answers and probably some organization would be able to say yes. I would suspect that even the organizations that, that, that I work with sort of that are beyond before CSRD, they still don't know. So if you don't know that suspects that you probably don't have the answer yet, you might get some good surprises that you have more uh, information than you thought you would have. So that's the cautious version. The less cautious version is if you don't know what you have, very, very likely you're not ready to do that you're not reporting on it. And I think there's certainly one category, which is the definition for HR is being transformed. The one workforce is is not only employees, it's people that contribute on a continuous basis to the value of the organization, which I think is a very fascinating mm. definition mm. for you to look at. So this is broader than your own typical sort of employee base, which makes it no, I don't think most organizations are ready to report because in Europe, there's sort of, there used to almost to be a distinction. Like I'm, I'm not looking from an HR perspective at the non-employees. Now you have to take responsibility. So I think that side for sure, most organizations would not be ready. And I would suspect that's the case for all, all the other. At the same element, it's a bit of a buildup as well, David. If you look at some of these guidelines, there's a lot of qualitative reporting as well. So which for us more quants is something that, well, it's not going as far yet, but it's a, to your point, it's a train. And they're already talking about, we're talking about sort of the one and the one workforce, but there's already sort of, and there's there's more to come in terms of other reporting guidelines, which they're already sort of drafting. So there is more to come, which will make it uh, even more interesting to sort of see how we move there. And I think this is where some of the clients that I speak with are even frustrated because it's like, how much and how do you, what's the impact is beyond compliance. I think from a positive side, this is really to your point, you can make an impact because you're lucky, looking at the performance of your organization. So the value of your organization, which is driving sort of a, 
I'm sure the sort of conversation you and I wanted to have about HR and people for ages, but have to do that as a more consistent basis for organizations. So I think I'm looking forward sort of to, it will be chaos for many organizations, probably 24, 25, because of, well, they might underestimate the work. They might be very positive about what they already have. But I think that chaos is also, chaos is a good opportunity to sort of accelerate and speed up sort of the impact of insights on the people aspects of the organization, because I think they make a big difference and it shows absolutely. Now, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it does seem a move, you know, when we think about workforce planning now, you know, organizations traditionally were just looking at permanent employees and, you know, actually, when you actually look at the data, a significant proportion of sometimes key workers are not permanent employees. And traditionally, of course, you know, HR has only looked at permanent employees, procurement have looked at contingent labor and, and you know, maybe looks at, you know, consultants as well that, that they may be using. And this, this is an opportunity, I guess, for um, HR to maybe get their, their arms around all of this and think about the workforce as a whole. Yes. Um, you know, the fact that they're having to the report on that, I think, makes it very interesting as, as well. You know, maybe for some of our listeners, because, again, whether they whether they the maturity level i understand you know is there is there the right level of awareness currently with with organizations that this is this is something they're going to be required to do and maybe what maybe as part of that eve maybe could you share some of the key metrics that that hr need to be looking at and, and maybe how they can get started now so so, so started there's a lot of public information available about that so this, this is eu so everything is transparent it might be lengthy to read and it might be uh, sometimes not straightforward but there are glossaries and definitions so in that sense the sort of the level of self-help that that IFRAC, which sort of uh, the, the organization that's supporting the guidelines for reporting, has developed. There is some video, so I think they have they've done some nice work there. Um, it's sort of it, it's a self help guide. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the data that you have or don't have in your organization. That is a part you need to do yourself. I think a number of organizations have started to look at it, not specifically from the people angle, because the people angle is about 100 data points out of 1,100. So it's sort of this, it's a massive effort for your enterprise altogether. And then you get into discussions like, do you this, do this by functional silo? Do you do this by um, for the enterprise level as well? And I think you already made the point, David, if you're looking at the sort of the broader workforce definition, there's something that used to be a procurement consideration that now is sort of a one workforce reporting consideration. I think it's a good opportunity to do that in a more consistent way, probably recognizing that in most enterprises, it might be divided between sort of some technology angle, the direct managers have responsibility, maybe even strategy that's involved in joint ventures and, and the likes. So I think that's, that's quite interesting to, to get started. I think there is some easy way to sort of do a bit of self-testing and eh? there is many criteria to look at. There's some elements which are fairly simple and eh? when work life is not very much elaborated, it has sort of what's the right of people to have family related leave and how much is it used um, depending on the sophistication of sort of uh, the, the countries where you're active. There might be sort of different ones and you have to look into to what extent is it used. It becomes a bit more interesting when you get into sort of how much has it been asked for because different applications exist in different countries how much can you sort of do you need to give it to um, do you need to give it to a percentage of people what is a sort of ways to say no an enterprise for whatever good reason of criticality and so on and so forth so that's something which is not too difficult in itself but then the question is it is it automated because you want to look at it and uh, not just from a manual perspective and then it has also adequate wages uh, which is sort of looking at minimum standards by types of activities and then you sort of it becomes already more grander because depending on how many activities how many types of jobs you would have in your organization looking at minimum wages is something quite broad to look at and you look at minimum wages in terms of do you have a standard by country do you have a standard at eu level that also starts to be sort of a bit more work and it can also become a bit more interesting because if looking at the sort of the pay gap there's a sort of a male female is the wording that is used there so looking looking at that spread it it is quite sort of average level so i think this is where there's also a bit of a risk in my mind you can look at averages and i'm sure you know that as well and david but maybe you should be more looking at it just a gender pay gap because in terms of is there more tendency to work part-time yes we see that women tend to work more part-time in some uh, countries in europe for example than in others for some types of activities let's make sure that these sort of the the the, the adjusted gender pay gap is what you are using as well in terms of also looking at taking action and there it also looks at action taken and that's where your point about 23 24 25 
well, actions taken. If you uh, you have to report uh, in 25, well, you start reporting. We also have to start to compare what was the data in 24, 23, what's the action that you had taken, to what extent have you closed on the gap. It's not clear in terms of any penalties or any sort of consequences, but people that read your report as a shareholder, whatever dimension, if they don't see progress, there's an expectation of progress that is there. So I think that's also driving, and there's many, many more elements. Some of them are not very sophisticated. Some are more interesting out of that list of one work, one workforce 80 data points, which I think is a very interesting uh, perspective. So you can get started. The video self-help you can do. There's, of course, many consultants, advisors that also want to help. I think starting by uh, understanding what it is about, how much is it, uh, that you need to cover and also sort of getting beyond what data do you have. So take the most difficult data points, check for your own organization. That should give you a sense of, well, how much work is there? Because I think there is no time to waste. I think that would be probably suggestion number one. There's no time to waste. So if you're a, a CHRO or people analytics leader listening to this and you haven't yet got your arms around this, you, you probably need to be getting your arms around this sooner rather than later. And if you have waited that long, you might need some help, actually, I think. because then there you is... might need some help. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know, and again, we'll put, a, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. I know you were on a webinar that, that, that Vizia organized actually recently, yeah. which I think would be helpful for people that really want to dig into this topic a little bit more. I think what's interesting as well is this is kind of a move where, number one, there's more regulatory requirement to disclose certain human capital information. But actually, if we think wider, um, you, you know, the, there's more data being collected about people within organizations, more data available. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about um, some studies that you've been doing at Deloitte, um, you know, around this this need for actually, if you really want to create a healthy environment around people data, the, the, the you know, transparency and trust are, are really important. Absolutely. Um, and actually, in a way, this is this is a way that employees, savvy employees, potential employees in the future will be able to look at the organisations that they potentially want to work for um, and look where they are around things like um, gender pay gap and, and everything else and equal pay. So it, it's, it's quite an interesting move, really. And. As you said, and as we've discussed, this is a great opportunity for HR um, to become more data driven um, in their strategic approach. And, and as I said, I referenced the excellent recent paper that you and your colleagues at, at Deloitte um, recently published, uh, which actually highlighted in my regular monthly roundup of, of resources for May. Um, and I definitely recommend that people read it. It's called Beyond Productivity, The Journey to the Quantified Organization. Um, and for those interested listeners, the report, which, you know, we will provide a link to that as well in the transcript, highlights the opportunities to use workforce data to gain a holistic view of the organization to help create value, uh, not just for employees or individuals, but also teams, the organization and actually society as well, uh, which is something that Jonathan and I talked about in Excellence in People Analytics. We think about actually the benefit it can provide to the wider society. So, so Eve, lovely if you could tell us a little bit more about about this research and, and specifically how does the value created at each level reinforce value that at the other levels as well? I think it's 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 largely influenced by also sort of more and more workforce ecosystems and ecosystem thinking altogether, which is something that we've been starting to look into sort of more specifically as part of our human capital trends. And then we typically dive a bit deeper. Uh, and this is where this this research is a bit of a deeper follow-up to some of the trends we started touching upon. I think it also looks at, at the sort of different levels, individual teams, organization or enterprise and society, because I think this is where we are, uh, our enterprise or organization are expected to interact at all these levels. And we, we touched on, on, on CSRD as an example. This is something that's clearly at the crossroad between what's needed to be done at an organization level so what is the data that you need, the insights that you need, and do you want more? Because, of course, nothing stops you from going beyond the regulations and seeing a competitive edge. At the same time, this is also where it touches on, on, on society, where you get into elements of, for example, geolocation, which is very interesting technology and how you can use that not only for the benefit of your enterprise, and think about prevention of deforestation, which is sort of also has an impact on whatever activity you ha might have and deforestation might be something that has an impact on your activity but it certainly also has a link to society uh, more broadly and mm -hmm. i think this is where our report is looking into all different facets not all many facets of how can we gain more insights and gain more performance on on, on individuals 
But for example, it looks specifically into elements of wellness, well-being, which is typically a, a fairly individual element. And there is real-time evidence that you can use in different sort of environments to use a different sort of pattern recognition, which is looking at, well, uh, David, it's, you, you might... You might be tired. Huh? We, you might know that in your car, a suggestion to take a break. There's sort of these small cues, but it can be more advanced in terms of, well, how do you help problem solving, which is sort of speeding up, sort of and not getting stuck in something. That sort of pattern recognition is very useful at individual level. Yet you also see the team level, which is also looking at, well, in many organizations, the team is where the actual performance happens less and less at individual level. So you get into the connection of what's the best team setup, how do you improve on the team setup. So we've been looking at, it's a quite an extensive report, looking at sort of many different facets of how can you improve insights at that individual level. For example, again, careers, which is typically a very individual progress that you make or evolution that you make, yet it also influences maybe even the structure of your organization over time. So we looked at very different elements, which I think is also very practical in terms of quite quite many good examples that you can unpack uh, if you are more a, a do-it-yourself um, type of perspective is also in that uh, in, in, in that study. And it also reflects on how to make all of that happen because I think you mentioned it, trust is certainly one of the key drivers of how organizations are creating more and more insights and how this is used for the benefit of these different stakeholders as well. Yeah, I think what, one of the things I really enjoyed in the study was it, it made a point right up front, you know, this is not about some of these sort of stealth productivity tools that some organizations are using to monitor employees, um, which I think we both agree would advise companies maybe not to use. Um, but this is about using workforce data for the benefit of, of all stakeholders, as you said, at the individual level, at the team level, where you can really turn the move the dial, I think, on on, on things like productivity and, and, and wellness, because if you can get the te get teams to perform better, then that has a bigger impact on the organisation, doesn't it? And as you said, the, the societal part as well. Um, so what is the, you know, uh, you know what what is the role of hr i'm going to ask a big open question so we have a big conversation about this probably but what what is the role of hr and and people analytics in in reinforcing this i think this this is this is a critical role it's also a conversation that 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 you have in terms of the end of jobs and evolution towards skills and what's the role of hr and and if i use sort of maybe a bit of an anecdote but when 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 our job description used in the life cycle of an employee, this is fairly limited in most organizations. It is at it is at hiring, maybe at termination, and then in between, it's mostly used for ISO audits, certificates where you need job descriptions to have that. But that's where that's the only thing. So from a frequency of use for an individual or for an individual's role, this is fairly limited. So we need other things as as leaders, as managers to get insight in terms of how does the work get done on a day-to-day -day basis and, and this is where sort of that restrictive approach that job descriptions are actually narrowing the boundaries of what you do there's more and more need for flexibility and i think that insights on work and you talked about teams it, it's fascinating to look at these examples where you have video pattern recognition in in shift work which is actually helping to sort of have dynamic sort of allocation of breaks because there is days where we are a bit more tired for whatever sort of reason we didn't sleep that well uh, our favorite team won or lost on the weekend, whatever it is, and that has an influence on actually can we use more shorter breaks or a bit longer breaks. That's something which is in the benefit of 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 all uh, in in terms of shift because there's prevention of accidents, the production levels, quality levels are up as well, which I think is a very good way of using that. But it requires trust in all parties involved. But you can also see this is sort of at the level of the actual shift itself. But you can also sort of redistribute how the production chain actually can improve in terms of continuous improvements, which might even lead to redesign of the production chain to you stay in the same example, which is redesigning the organization. I think this is where, for me, this is where we're moving away from what sometimes is a more classic remit of the HR function, like we provide the best people, we support education to a certain level, but actually we're not involved in the day-to-day -day activities. I think it's the day-to-day -day activities where we need to gain more insights and I would prefer HR to do it. But looking mm. at these insights about how the work gets done or shift allocation, this is typically where it's a bit of a sensitive thing. Like technical skills is something that many HR leaders want to stay away because it's the business should know better how work is done. The business should know better. Yes, but what is our role, at least in HR, to provide insights 
to help in sort of improving on decision making to go beyond some of the convictions or some of the experiences and the biases that we have. I think that's a critical moment for HR to step in. And I think the link to the broader workforce helps because it reduces the bargaining power that managers have. Because uh, as a manager, it's great. You ask HR something to solve from a talent perspective. But at the same time, you ask procurement. At the same time, you might use your network. At the same time, you might use whatever sort of joint venture support. You have options as a manager. By making it more transparent, I think you will reduce options, which I think is not a bad thing because it, it forces you to take more transparent choices. Mm. And that transparency also helps to build more trust at different levels. But it's great to sort of see these pattern recognitions, which used to be science fiction. Eh? Back in when I was in my sport days, you have access to that data. The transparency and trust comment you made, David, is critical, but then you get into great insights, which as long as you use it for the benefit of all and not saying, yeah, but David, you can handle less breaks. You need less breaks than me. So maybe we should get rid of me. That is that is the sort of negative use of that. It's supposed to be uh, mutually beneficial. And as long as you have that credibility, there's fascinating things that you can get out of it. And I, I guess it's if we look at it in a broad sense, you know, with with data, with people data, with some of the external data that we can use as well, and particularly when we actually then bring it together with some business data, you know, it, it gives HR the opportunity to not, you know, to, as you said, not just support and recruitment or support a, a career transition or support an exit or support at learning. Um, it, it, it's an opportunity to really support work, workforce and workplace, you know, even workplace design as well, as well as we think about hybrid work. And it really to move the needle on, on the organisation, as you said, at those four levels, you know, at the individual level, at the team level, at the organisational level, and also ultimately the societal level as well. Um, you know, it's, I mean, what are, you know, again, you, you may not know how to name names, but what are some of the practices that you're seeing from some of the clients that you're working with that, that he's, he's kind of moving towards that, that, that kind of nirvana, shall we call it? <laughs> Yeah, one of the, the examples um, that, that that I love to share it's it's a it's a pharmaceutical. It's still sort of at a proof of concept. It's only about thousand people, which in their case is sort of a fraction of their workforce. But it's looking very much at the perspective of of the team. So we 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 moved away from these thousand people to look at sort of things like engagement survey for that group as, as sort of an average for that group. It's very much what they shifted to is there's a cycle where these HR business partners in that environment, they have conversations about how is the sort of the status of the teams. They look at the teams. It was long discussion. What is a team was a working group, but they came to sort of a consensus like, and this is the assumption we start with in terms of these are the teams that we have within that population of thousand people. And on a quarterly basis, they're looking at sort of the team perspective. And they're looking at the team perspective in terms of how well is that team doing and performance-wise. It was a bit of a discussion as well in terms of what's really performance. So we had a, quite a broad setup and we used it as well to enrich the data. Like let's looking at the progress of the team performance and sort of what is the direction of travel. Do we see the team performance uh, stay stable, go up or go down? as one axis and the second axis was also looking at the perspective of uh, sort of a proxy for how how good is the team from a well-being perspective which is also turned out to be quite correlated with the sort of the actual trajectory uh, of the performance but it's looking at it from a team level which meant that in a conversation with you david if you would be the leader of a number of these people it would be let's not discuss your group but let's discuss the seven teams that you have and let's sort of discuss at the level of team one, team two, and what are sort of actions to be taken. And by doing this with a quarterly cycle, it also something that these HR business partners, that some of them were not very analytic, insight savvy. They were sort of, well, it's important, but I don't really know how to use it to sort of getting into conversations about, well, this is the trajectory sort of every quarter on the team. Let's look at it. Let's do something. Let's take action. But with a three month cycle, it's also it feels like a fairly sort of quick cycle, which is something that the business leaders like, because otherwise it's sometimes it felt in their case like, well, HR is coming with this sort of biannual engagement survey. And then we take sort of fairly generic actions is at least there was a perception in that organization and, and to take it from there. So I think this is a good practice, which is looking at for me to sort of mm. get closer to sort of a real cycle for the business, get faster in terms of actions, maybe not be too ambitious either, but at the same time. There's a wealth of data created because the trajectory in many cases 
it was wrong because you would say as a leader, well, I think the trajectory of that team is going actually up and you would see next quarter actually it went down or you were right. It also sort of adds additional information, but it also improved the sort of quote unquote humility for the leaders to say, well, what are the decisions we need to take? And it sort of reinforced the relationship with the HR business partners. Like these are really useful insights for me in how I can sort of drive and improve my business without taking over. So that's why I like that example. It's uh, it's early days because it's only thousand people of a sort of hundred plus thousand people uh, organization, but I think it's very promising um, uh, yeah, activity that they've done, which I think is also generating even more data. And to your point, it combines some people data with other sort of indicators. It's a commercial environment, so a lot of commercial indicators as well, uh, which is an easier element of performance to look at at measuring commercial performance and it might be in some other environments yet i think it's a good way to sort of look at progress and i think you've made it it's an important point is it that if you're in a big organization of over a hundred thousand people you know and you want to try something you know do it in a do it in a smaller group where there is a defined need where you've got a supportive business leader that that that's keen to f- f- get insights to try and you know improve performance yes. improve productivity improve revenue whatever it whatever the outcomes it is that they're trying to move try it there and then see you know learn from it iterate and then maybe look if you can apply it elsewhere in the organization as well if you want to scale it i think it's it, don't be afraid to start small i think it's quite a, it's quite a good and it 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 started from connecting two things david because the the the, the commercial leadership was looking at uh, at two challenges around people one challenge was well and there was a lot of sort of perception that uh, at least perception if not more that workload was too high priorities not clear sort of sort of uh, sort of post-covid type of moment where sort of well and everything is important everything is a priority sort of perception sort of with some uh, ratings going down on engagement which was one driver and the second one is we need to win more in the markets and we miss a bit that competitive behavior which we would like to see more of and they were treating it as a separate conversation. And by bringing it into one conversation, it again made it a bit more holistic in terms of this is one conversation because it's, and it was a bit of the aha moment for them. Like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to discuss sort of like engagement and the next hour to discuss performance about uh, where are we winning, where are we losing? These two things are the same when you connect at individual level. And that's how sort of it drove, let's do something, let's find some more insights with a very sort of humble attitude, like let's and let's find more evidence, let's see how we can take action. And, and by doing it on a quarterly basis, it also helped sort of fuel the decision making. It was not so much, we will tell you managers if you're right or wrong. No, it's learn. let's learn from mm. this together. And yet let's improve the performance and the well-being of every single team and not work into averages, which I think is a very good way forward. Yeah, no, it's a great example. And, and you mentioned HR business partners and, and you said that, some HR business partners are maybe more data literate than others. I think that certainly applies in, in most organizations. Um, you know, and, and I think as a whole, the HR business partner um, community is, is, uh, is on an evol- evolutionary journey to become more data driven. And I guess it's examples like that when they can see it, it can help them in their day to day work and the businesses they support that encourages them to, 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 to make the effort to do that. Cause let's be honest, it's a very challenging role being an HR business partner, but, in, in your view and your experience, how can people analytics teams help smooth their part, the path of HR business partners and maybe other HR professionals so that HR can get to that level more quickly? Where it helps is to unpack the problems that they're trying to solve as an HR business partner. There is a very serving nature in most people, like how can we serve, how can we help our internal clients Um which means that helping to gain insights in is this even the right problem to solve? That's where I think the HR or people analytics teams can help to to bring some insights to actually, well, we, we think that we have a challenge in um, in the age pyramid, for example, in our workforce, um, again, thinking about the same commercial environment. How is that actually making an impact? Is there, sort of, is, mm. is there even a link uh, to be found there? I think that's that's element. Second element was sort of one of the questions that they had was like, what's the difference between the performance of the employees and the agent based workforce that they had in some other markets, which was interesting to sort of see sort of what are the drivers of performance, which was also stimulating the conversation like there was a belief we should have more agents, we should have less agents. 
which I think is interesting conversation to have. But adding some of these people insights um, to the conversation was not replacing the decision making, but it was actually helping the decision making. I think this is where there's a bit of that paradox where most HR business partners, they love to contribute more to the decision making. They feel very good when they're involved into the more strategic conversations, but they sometimes lack a bit of that insight. And I think this is where the, the HR analytics, Pematics teams can actually provide more and more of these insights. Yet the clear hypothesis, what decision we would like to take, mm. that's the interesting part. Because I, I feel that most HR leaders, HR business partners, they get more airtime on the leadership teams they serve. But then the more airtime is actually not more data or insight driven, the more airtime is used to sort of spend time on longer discussions about talent, but not necessarily better discussions about talent decisions, because I think this is where, how do we move people? Do we move people? Do we move them in full? Do we actually have them contribute to something which is part of the learning and evolution? How do we recombine sort of team setups? Maybe how do we reorganize, which is sort of very sort of fashionable these days to reorganize? Is it actually yielding the benefits we expected by the reorganization? Did we, were we clear on the expected benefits of reorganizing? So it's both the people at the more individual side, but also the department, organization, team setup. I think this is where these hypotheses are clear and where the insights can be um, can be very helpful. And and saying we don't know from an HR people analytics is also very helpful because then it sort of reduces sort of the discomfort. Like we want to take quote unquote the right decision, but if it's something where the evidence is not clear yet. Well, that means that as a leader, you can know that you're comfortable to take the decision without more insights. Where and there's sometimes the in most cases actually, I think David, there is a lot of insights that can be brought by HR and people analytics team. Yeah, and I guess to to do that, I guess the people analytics teams needs to understand the different nuances of the business units, don't they? So they can actually be providing insights that so it's. It's a lot of it's about good communication, isn't it, between the people analytics consultants, if they've got consultants in the team, the HR business partners and, and the business leaders so they can really understand, you know, what's the business trying to achieve, what are the outcomes they're trying to affect, and that will then ho hopefully, and then what are the people elements of that, and that should hopefully help them provide the insights that supports those conversations and maybe prompts deeper questions, bigger questions that that, that, that maybe involve more specialised people analytics work. Um, this is the this is the question this is the question of the series Eve, um, and it's it's a little bit related to the one we've just asked. I'm going to ask this question, give you an answer, and I'm going to share some research that that we've just done at Insight Two 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 actually um, around this building is data driven culture piece in in HR, and get your reaction to that as well. But firstly, if you know, as I said, this is the question we're asking everyone in this series: How can HR leaders? Um, how can they build a data-driven and digitally literate culture in HR? There's different answers because I think there's different sort of uh, preferences. I, I think there's still many HR leaders that have a let's get the basics um, under control or even perfect. And I think sort of going against that is, is sometimes difficult in my experience because it's like get it even better. But then you should have the insights of looking at uh, how many cases do you have open in all sort of HR requests um, at every sort of uh, real-time information or as close as possible number of exceptions, which is really sort of the operational side of all the HR services and products you're offering. I think that's something which sort of gives you the credibility because you can then speak in terms of quantified uh, elements like how many exceptions we have because this is typically where a lot of time it seems to be spent in HR is we discuss a lot of exceptions. But if exceptions are 1%, 5%, 10%, 20%, or 50%, that is a very different view on what is actually an exception and how much time is. So that is, for me, more the sort of the bottoms-up perspective, uh, I, I think, from a sort of more classic, let's be very strong in our HR function. I think the other side is looking at, I think, reorganization are very fashionable. But I'm always surprised by the speed of reorganizations. It's like even before you can actually measure the benefits of the reorganization, there's a next wave of reorganization. So I think there is, for me, something in between where I think HR business partners and certainly HR leaders have a role to play. Let, let's try to be a bit more explicit about what are the benefits of the reorg that we want to achieve. Um, let's also see how we want to measure them, because I think there's also a learning because a, a reorganization is sort of an easy fix for a leader. I want more or less of something 
and I'm shifting the organizational structure, which of course is one way to sort of create a bit of movement. But I think it's it it is a it, it's a nauseating effect. Like let's go left, let's go right. At some point, if you're part of the team, it's like where is this going? But I think this is where is this going from a customer satisfaction, which is probably important. Is it about innovation? Is it about both? Let's measure actually if that new organization is stimulating more innovation. Let's get into that level. And I think this is where it would typically not be considered HR. Yeah. Huh? Are we more innovative as an organization? But I think it's it's people behavior. It is organizational behavior. And I think this is where, for me, I would encourage HR leaders to go in that direction. And you can do that sort of whatever your, your level of self-confidence or humility. Let's do that sort of in an open, inquisitive, questioning approach in terms of what you really want to achieve with this uh, reorganization, or organization evolution or shift and how will we actually know that we are getting there? And I think this is where HR business partners, but for me, the head of HR is also the first HR business partner. How do we do that? How do we make more measurable? And sometimes it's difficult to measure, but I think we have a lot of measuring techniques and access to external data and others. That excuse should be long gone now. Yeah, and, and before I actually share this, the insight of the research, there's something that, that, that one to react to is you talked about people do transformations and then they, so they don't even measure the impact of the trans transformation before they try and do another one, an organ reorganization. And actually, analytics can really support, measure the impact of, of transformation. So if you're reorganizing teams, for example, you can look at network analytics to understand are the new teams forming or, or are they not forming? Um, in, I, I, I don't know if you're seeing that in some of the organizations that you're working with at the moment, that kind of increased use of network analytics. Absolutely. And, and sort of network analysis and you see it for different, for yielding collaboration. I think the degree of collaboration is something that I hear many leaders and CEOs complain about. We need to collaborate more, collaborate more, but then they don't have even a good proxy of level of collaboration in their organization that goes beyond um, surveys that looking at sort of, well, how collaborative are we in the organization? But that's a very vague statement. I think the collaboration is between activities, between functions, between squads, between tribes, whatever your setup is. I think that's where sort of gaining an insight, but also sort of consciously improving on the level of collaboration is back to the comment we made about trust. How mm. do we keep on raising the level of trust, transparency about who's doing what, how to achieve it? But indeed, that network analysis is becoming increasingly used, not just as a nice experiment, but more on a continuous, not literally, but on a sort of regular basis, looking into how do we improve our collaboration index in sort of in this quarter, next quarter, which I think is a good practice as well in terms of if you struggle with collaboration, but you don't have any sort of indication or proxy even of collaboration because it's a complicated construct. I think that's a sort of minimum. Uh, at least your driving temperature is also, let's get into the right direction. I think sometimes we don't need to make it too sophisticated to get started and let's improve the measurement over time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it, when we've, we we did some, we published some research, we're recording this in July, we're actually publishing it in two weeks' time, but by the time this episode is aired, it will be available for people to, to download themselves. And we, we were looking into upskilling HR specifically in data literacy and looking at organizations that were doing this well and versus organizations that were struggling with it. And and two of the four key insights that we found, and I'd love to get your reaction to this, Eve, was number one, you know, if you want to create a data-driven HR function, um, then role modeling by the CHRO and the HR leadership team is really important. You know, we found that where the CHRO and the HR leadership team were displaying a data-driven approach themselves, then the rest of HR, particularly HR business partners that maybe weren't part of that team, were more likely um, to invest time in, in, in upskilling them scales. Obviously, the organization needs to provide the tools for them to do that. And the second thing we found was that where responsibility for upskilling sits with the people analytics leader, uh, again, organizations, um, HR practitioners were far more likely to develop their skills and, and interestingly, more budget would be allocated to uh, for, for that exercise as well. Now, obviously, the people analytics leader and their team would be supported by colleagues in learning around des learning design or maybe external providers. And again, I know obviously Deloitte, and particularly over the years that, that you know since acquiring Inostics, you know you've been working with organisations to help them on this journey. And I don't know if you've seen any examples of that around role modelling or, or the people analytics leader taking a lead on the upskilling of, of, of data or any other insights that you'd like to share around that. But I'd love to hear those. I think we see different movements, uh, one which is completely in line with that, which is a CHRO 
taking more sort of a data-driven approach, more insight-driven. I tend to use sort of more insights into decisions because I think this is where um, HR is not always very explicit about how how are we supporting improvement of decision making and of course you can do that into classic hr decisions which is the minimum i think but you can also go further as we discussed in terms of other work related decisions imagine that sort of the the shift composition the team composition and the continuous improvement there i think that's a good example of where is that strictly hr or is that the leader or is the hr supporting the leader i think these are good examples it's interesting to see sort of how HR applies that to themselves, which mm-hmm. I don't see that often. Um, I think the sort of analytics leader, I see sort of two schools of thoughts. One, which is more sort of there is a increasing sort of presence of a chief data officer, which is looking at AI and so on and so forth, which is sometimes overshadowing more people analytics activities or whether including it in what they're doing. Because if you're looking at sort of massive opportunities in AI, it has a people implication in many different ways. Is that something that is done true from a people analytics lens or is that more the sort of broader analytics capability, the organization, is it done together? I think that's where there's a, there's a requirement for speed and I see where the HR function is not really following suit in terms of speed and capabilities. It seems to be overshadowed by the broader uh, data AI capabilities in an organization. So it's it's both. Yes, I think you're right. At the same time, I think there is a bit of an internal threat. Um, mm. If it doesn't happen from a people or HR perspective, it will happen through other angles. Because the success of AI, when you do research about how organizations are successful at using AI at scale, for example, it's still very limited. The one is successful. There is elements of culture, leadership skills that come into play as well which of course is 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 is, is, is core business to hr um, so yes i think this is absolutely um, something that i'm sure that that both our organization are helping uh, to move the needle on that and i think there is an alternative which is then the, the chief data officers but i think i would prefer the hr function uh, to drive that but back in our agnostics comments i remember sort of when i went to hr leaders back in the days before agnostics I had my BI colleague with me and sort of HR leaders would look and they would get sort of like it would go left and right and sort of like we were saying different different things and how to connect and it was a very difficult element. I think the sort of insights about people behavior is still a sort of a very unique perspective that HR and people and things need to bring to the field and we need to sort of major in that behavioral uh, individual mm. organizational behavior component and how we can improve decisions related to that that's why i sort of try to shift the conversation from data and insights to actually what is the decisions that you're supporting and can hr i would love hr to be able to say well this year we helped improving 10,000 decisions and we actually didn't help on another sort of 500 decisions or we made 10 very bad decisions but that sort of notion of we are improving on decision making gets us back to sort of my my bias from sports which is well you you, you mentioned a great football team in terms of they all, all make bad decisions as well, but they're reducing the number of bad decisions. They're increasing the number of good yeah. decisions. They're increasing the capability to make decisions. And I think the sort of the influence, the inspiration is still very valid. How to do that from an environment where you want to drive the performance standards on a continuous basis, but also in a more sustainable. I think that's where sports is is not comparable because the career of, in sports is typically fairly short compared to a career in business. So the sustainability angle is is more important for businesses. No, it's a really good point. And that actually, I mean, it's a good way to, to end our conversation that, you know, all this data and insights that we're collecting and, and analysing, ultimately it's, it's, it's worthless if it's not actually impacting on decisions and outcomes. Um, and as you said, it's, it, it should be used to inform the decision, not be the decision. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's a you know, key thing that we're seeing companies that are doing this well. They're, they're doing that, as you said. I'm not sure if anyone's measuring the metric on how many decisions that their work impacts, but maybe it's a good one. So, Eve, thanks so much for being a guest on the Digital HR Leaders podcast. It's I've uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Can you let listeners know how they can keep in touch with you on social media or find out more about your work at Deloitte? So the work at Deloitte is published on websites globally in every specific country, sometimes translated to to your language. So that's where it's available on Deloitte website, Human Capital pages. Um, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn, uh, all the social medias. I'm not that active anymore. So you can follow me as well on, on LinkedIn or connect with me on LinkedIn. Perfect. Eve, thanks very much for your Pleasure. time and uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Likewise. Thank you, David.
In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.